The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You are now tuned in to the PA Power Podcast, College Edition, featuring Rob Waldco and Joe Youngblood. PA Power Wrestling. PA Power Wrestling. Pennsylvania is wrestling. Hey, wrestling fans, here we are, another week in the open room with Rob and Joe. Getting ready to talk about the week that was and what's in store for the week that, that, that will be. Rob, a lot happened this weekend. A lot of wrestling went down, upsets, trash talking, and then a few other surprises in the mix that uh, just came about today. So let's, uh, let's hop right in. What do you got? Let's get us, go, let's get us started. Yeah, so we, we could probably do this for about five, six hours if we really didn't pace ourselves or jump on the stuff we see as important, but you know, jump in right away. Some of the PA teams in action. Uh, Edinburgh had a nice win over Cleveland State, 24-13. to uh, Clarion uh, beat George Mason, 27-16. to We're going to get a chance, actually, to talk to Mason Beckman uh, later about uh, just his transition over to George Mason. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Lehigh, they're back on track. Uh, a couple wins over American and Navy. But, um, you know, some of the stuff we want to focus on, uh, PA Midwest over in Iowa, they went 4-0. Uh, on Friday night, you had uh, Spencer Lee with a quick fall, uh, Max Murin, a, a workman like 8 4 victory, uh, Caleb Young 5 to 2 over Van Brill. I think I said 5 to 2 is my prediction, but the one everyone's talking about. Yeah, that was somewhere, somewhere in that ballpark. You were close. Yeah, it, it was, he looked good, though. He's very workman like, very tough to score on. DeSanto, 6 to 4, you know, last second takedown, uh, possibly some Carver stall calls, but I mean, he, he drove the action. What do you think about this kid? I mean, we both counted him out. I didn't think he was going to win. You didn't. He got the win, maybe acted up a little bit afterwards. But talk about the match, Joe. What did you think uh, of what went down there? Probably exactly opposite what I think I said last week. Um, I thought Siriano, and I'm going to need some crow right now, fans, and and feel free to give it to me. I was wrong, and I, I, I admit when I'm wrong, and I'll stand up. Uh, and and yelled out. Uh, I I had Siriano winning going away. I think by, I said around by four four points. I felt his horsepower would have been too much for DeSanto. Uh, but all DeSanto does uh, or has done is, is proven me wrong on these these predictions. So I I don't know. Maybe I'm to the point where I'm going to stop picking against him uh, when it comes to these uh, these larger matches. Uh, you know, he's definitely, he, he was the one that pushed the pace late. And like you said, maybe some Carver Hawkeye stall calls, but you know, you watch that match on a stretch and, and, and Serrano doesn't do a whole lot. Like I was, I was impressed with the pace that, and, and how the Santa was able to impose his will in that third period. And, you know, he's down a point, uh, you know, with the riding time, he needed to take down and, and he did just that. Uh, but what I have the issue with, and I'm not going to back off this one, is the is the after match antics. You know, it's one thing to be passionate, which he is, and we all know that. And he wears his emotions on his sleeve. But at what point is someone in that in that program going to tell him, "Hey, you know, we, we can't have this." Uh, you know, you saw Brands run right on the mat and grab him and and try to 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 head him off and and quell it. And he, and he still chirped their way back to the middle of the mat. And, he, you know, he gave him a pat on the chest uh, after they shook hands. Uh, at that point, I don't think Surya wanted anything of it. Uh, so guys are going to remember that stuff, Rob. Uh, you know, you not only the, the loss, but the, you know, the getting down in his face and, and, and barking at him a little bit. Uh, you know, I don't know what was said. But, you know, I'm sure he wasn't, uh, you know, asking them to, to hang out after the game and, uh, or after the match and, and play Fortnite. Uh, that's my that's my thing. I, I won't back off on that. Tremendous talent, and he, I think he's he, he just continues to get better. You know, he's finding other ways to win, and he's evolving. Where he he's he's in. There's not a match he won't be in, and you know, we always knew the motor was going to be there. And and now, you know, it's, it's it's. I think it was past him just having a good motor, and and him just nonstop working, like actually working to win, not just forcing forcing the pace and moving around. It's like a, a an un unshakable force or drive to just 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 beat his opponent um you know mentally and physically you do you, do you see that same thing rob a hundred percent you i mean you took the words from my mouth he's he's more calculated with his pace you know he's not he used to literally sprint off the line i would i'm like this guy is insane um but he's more plotting like instead of a 10 it's a constant nine but the difference between a nine and a ten is you don't make as many mistakes. I guess would be the way I put it. So I think they've done a really good job tactically with him. Uh, emotionally, 
Yeah, I mean, he's got to tone it down. I think he admitted that. It seems like he's saying the right things, but he has to do the right things. And I think everyone in that room is aware, Spencer Lee touched on it, that you know he's got to cut that out because he's going to you know, mess mess something up. He's going to say something he's going to regret, or he's going to do something just really outlandish. So he's hopefully working on it. Um, you know, more Big Ten action. You had, you had Ethan Lezak uh, win over Dylan Duncan, twelve to nine. Uh, was up big early and then let Duncan back in the match. So you know, some of those weight cutting woes might still be carrying him there. Um, Mikey Carr five to two over McKee. Mikey Carr is the Rodney Dangerfield of college wrestling. He can't get no respect. Um, he's just been solid for the last year and a half, you know, round of 12 last year, not really many big losses, a lot of big wins. Do you think he gets the respect he deserves from PA fans and just fans nationally, Joe? Cause I think he's a stud. No. And no, can't say it any better. And not to, you know, I, I, I don't want to say, I, I don't like that. We're agreeing so much this early in, in the, in the podcast, but Rodney Dangerfield is a humorous, albeit, same time like unfortunate comparison and that's uh, you know it gets a chuckle out of some people probably but at the same time like why isn't he getting the respect he deserves that he that he rightfully deserves he, he you know you said consistent he's he's been at that and a little bit more at least in the last uh, 18 months um, i can't you know i can't wait to see come march where he where the where the chips fall for him and, and where he ends up and and how it's not for me right now it's not a matter of if he's on the podium it's where he's going to be on the podium with the way he's wrestling right now that is no i i agree I, I fully expect him to be on the podium he's probably looking at a top four or five seed right now so certainly that's the uh the expectation you know jumping ahead let's talk about the pit match a few things you know jake wenzel big pin looked really strong at 165 uh, Pitt looked really poor at 41 and 49. They gave up two quick pins. Romani lost nine to three. A match he got the first takedown. They just he didn't seem to be in it. Um, Nino had the early lead on Jacoby Smith, but kind of shot himself out. And listen, we're not Division One coaches, so we're, I'm not calling Nino out. He would whip my butt. Um, but it seems like he's maybe a little bit too aggressive at times or shoots from too far away. But I think that's something they're going to fix, and he's going to get better by being aggressive. But again, 133. Pennsylvania's kind of taken over this weight class. Mickey Philippi, 3-1 over Dayton Fix. I'll be honest, I didn't see that one coming. I thought it would be competitive, but Fix would be too much. Joe, did you I mean, did you pick Mickey or even give him a chance in that match? Sorry, Mickey, I did not. You know, after after that match happened, I got a text from one of uh one of my friends and it was a picture of a, a dumpster on fire and he said what and, it, and the caption was 133 right now. You know, when I got that text, I was watching. Uh, I think I was watching Escape the Rock on on Flow. And truth be told, I think I think there was a a strong population inside that pit wrestling program that probably you know had a good idea that that was a possibility. Uh, you know, they they'd been wrestling with confidence, and Coach Gavin and his staff have had that team uh, maybe maybe wrestling above their actual ability uh, just through you know just motivation and co and, and their coaching. Uh, so they've been overachieving. Up to this point, and they ran into a real tough Oklahoma State team. Let, you know, let's let's call it what it is. But you, know, you still had guys that went out there. You know, even you said about Bonacorsi losing seven four, but he went out there and he was the aggressor. Uh, you know, he went out and he, and he he went out and and tried to set the pace, and and it, it you know it didn't work out for him. Maybe he, if he wrestles Smith again, the, the strategy becomes uh, you know changes a little bit, and maybe they they're more a little bit. Um, uh, selective with with how he, they're going to attack him, but you know again that's the, it was a good learning experience. Uh, you know for Philippi, probably learned a lot about himself and the unbelievable confidence boost you're going to get from beating a guy of the caliber of Fix. Fix coming off a match where he beat Suriano, and then you have Suriano then lose to DeSanto. I mean it, it's it's now with Gross gone, and you know Rob, you and I talked about this afterwards. It it's anyone's it's kind of anyone's weight class and you have all these people merging as as contenders uh, right now it's as wide open as any weight class and you can you can throw a dart at a dartboard at, at several different names and come march they might just get hot enough to win it you know that's it might, that's what it might come down to like gross like was you know again um no disrespect to the other wrestlers, probably as close to a lock as there was to repeat, even without Bono. Uh, this injury obviously proved too much, and you know he's going to miss the, the remainder of the season. I think maybe it, it, that gave everyone a, a, a shot in their confidence that hey, you know that this could be me now. This could be my weight class uh, after the dominance that that growth showed last year. 
What do you think? No, I agree. And you, you had asked me before, uh, in so many words, was, was Mickey, was his ranking justified, in my opinion? And I, I kind of sat on the fence, right? I didn't want to say no, because I, I don't think, I think he earned his ranking, but I didn't think he like established himself as a, a clear top four guy. The reason I say that, he beat Lee Zach, who I, I didn't think was going to have as much success at 33. And then he beat Pletcher, who's a guy who's wrestled a million times. So those two wins, it's, th- those are awesome wins. But nothing – they didn't really surprise me. They could go either way, I thought. But, I mean, at this point, I mean, Mickey, he's looking like a, a surefire, you know, all-American candidate. Um, whereas before, I thought there was maybe more guys that could beat him. But you beat Fix. I mean, you're right in the hunt. No question. Um, and, and just credit to him. He's doing an awesome job. Pitt's doing a really good job. They, they look really good. Um, you know, some additional action. Dakota Gear went 2-0 and for Oklahoma State. Beat Kellen Stout this weekend and beat Noah Adams from West Virginia. Uh, Ebbett Gerald pins Bullard uh, in the Drexel NC State match. So that's that's a big one. Two top 20 guys. Uh, Gerald's been a little dinged up, so nice to see him back in the mix. That's your you boy. Know, Penn State. Yeah, that's my that's my guy, my sleeper coming into the year. I'm glad he's wrestling well. You know, Penn State, they, they had a tough duel with Nebraska at home. Uh, the score didn't really reflect it, but there was a lot of competitive matches. 141, Lee uh, got by Chad Red by a point. Um, he was down late. Uh, 49, Burgey, he's not finishing the leg attacks that well. Nolf, Nolf is Nolf. I mean, he went out and beat the crap out of Tyler Berger. Uh, it was a decision, but he's in complete control. He's just on a different planet. Um, Chenzo, 2 to nothing over Isaiah White. This is a guy that just gives him loads and loads of trouble. Uh, do you think White can beat him, or do you think he's just good enough to keep it close right now, Joe? That's a good question. Is he good enough to beat him? Sure. Sure. I mean, at that level... And on any given day, uh, you know, anything can happen, not to tiptoe around the question, but right now, until, uh, you know, again, I, 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 was on, I was really on the Nebraska guys earlier in the year, and it seems like they kind of settled in, and, you know, you don't see, some, you don't see them taking some of those bad losses now. Isaiah White right now is wrestling good, well enough to keep it close. Uh, I think there's still another level change he needs to make to get in discussion to winning a match like that, but, you know, for me... For the time being, he's in that second high second tier of the 165 pounders. Would you agree with that assessment, or do you think that it's just it's one of those things where Vincenzo is that much better, and it's just where he just struggles? But he's in he's going to win a close match and mean total control the entire time. I think there's a matchup issue with White. I mean, he's taking him down. I think he took him down in NCAs in, in overtime, but the, and White dominated him in high school. Obviously, it's a different ball game, but there's a matchup issue there. There's something about White style. Um, Vincenzo's not able to get a hold of him the way he wants. He hit an inside trip and White defended. So there's something tactically there that is giving him issues to where I think Vincenzo, I mean, he's the favorite, but if anyone's going to beat him, it might be that guy. And maybe it's Wick because he hasn't got his hands on him yet, but definitely one to watch. Um, 74, you know, Pennsylvania's Mikey Labriola split takedowns with Mark Hall, ended up losing off of getting ridden, but. Were you surprised it was that close? Because I'll be honest, I was. Early in the season and, and, and up to now, I've, I really had the PA glasses on when I when I take a look at him and his body of work. So I'm going to say no. I'm not really surprised uh, that he wrestled on that. I'm not surprised he wrestled him tough. Uh, what I am surprised at is the score, if that makes sense. You know, I, I figured he was going to wrestle him tough and, and challenge Hall. I just didn't expect it to be a two-point match, if that makes sense. I, you know, I figured it would have been something a little bit closer, uh, or I'm sorry, a little bit more distance between the two of them. But, I mean, that that is that has to be a confidence builder for Labriola as, you know, we, we get in the, the third week of January here moving forward. So, uh, if I can, I'd like to go back and talk. Uh, you know, you mentioned about Nick Lee. Uh, Chad Red's one of those guys I talked about earlier in the season who just – just was kind of up and down, not very consistent. Uh, so I'm not surprised that, that you know he gave Nick Lee some fits on uh, over the weekend. Uh, I just think that uh, it, for him, uh, he's just inconsistent. If if he finds a way to be as consistent as he wrestled against Lee, he'll be a very tough out down the stretch. No, I, I tend to agree with you. He's the te- the skill is there for Red. When he's on, he's as good as anyone. It's just. You know, his on and off seem to have a, a wide gap versus some of those other top guys, right? You never see Yanni look terrible. You never see Ironman look terrible. You rarely see McKenna look terrible. And Red at times just does not look good. Um, you know, jumping into our preview for this week, 
big one for me. You know, speaking of 133, let's stay on topic. Stevan Micic versus Luke Pletcher. Number one, Micic versus six, Pletcher. Uh, Pletcher does have a win over him. He's one in three versus him career. Um, Micic, uh, the first time Pletcher kind of beat him up, Micic beat him up one or two times. And it was pretty competitive at Nationals. Micic doesn't wrestle anyone this year. I mean, he's been he's been injured. Uh, he got hurt right before the World Championships. Pletcher's been solid. He's been Pletcher. Uh, what do you see coming down with this one? Because, I mean, if I'm betting on it, I'm, I'm putting the put my pay on, on Micic, but obviously cheering for Luke. Do you think he gets over the hump here, or do you think Micic is just too much for him? Yeah, you know, I kind of go back and forth with this a little bit because Micic hasn't, you said, like he hasn't really wrestled anyone. Pletcher has. Uh, I do think though at the at the when when the dust settles this will be this will be a match for uh you know I'm going to go against Pia and this one is to be a match at Michich where you know he kind of lays a statement that this is his weight class now and you know he's the guy that everyone's got to be gunning for like he's I think this match he goes out and beats Pletcher and he he firmly puts the bullseye on his back at 133 pounds. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see a big rivalry match I mean, Pletcher, someone had told me when he was in high school that he's just got a knack for winning like nobody else. And, and he does, but that weight has a lot of guys that have that knack for winning, uh, unfortunately for him or fortunately for the fans. You have 41. You got the Illinois-Iowa uh, dual meet. Again, Rodney Tain, my man Rodney Dangerfield Carr, uh, he's facing Max Muir, and that's number four versus number 19. On paper, it doesn't look like a huge match. Right, Mirren's been up and down where he's ranked. He, he pretty much deserves that ranking. But he actually beat Carr last year. Um, that was at the Midlands before Carr really kind of caught fire. I think Carr goes out and, and gets the better of him today. I don't – or this week, excuse me. I'm not sure how Mirren scores on him. Uh, what are your thoughts, Joe? Do you see that one going any different? Or are you, uh, are we going to be chalk and, and making the same predictions again here? I'm on the car train right now. I think that the way he's wrestling – and this again, this would be yet another feather in his cap and his resume for you know come uh, you know come the seeds come March wrestling better right now. We we talked about Mirren and it's been a little bit up and down. He's still been winning matches, but just hasn't been uh, probably as consistent. Or maybe we're too critical, of maybe not winning as as easily as he should. I think we've been on a little bit, maybe a little critical of that. But I just think Carr is is just wrestling better all the way around, and I think he's gonna. You know, he's going to win this match. I, you know, again, uh, I haven't been right too often uh, with these with these predictions, uh, but you know, I, I feel strongly about Carr. Uh, definitely uh, having the upper hand on on Mirren. So, a little anecdote about Carr. You know, I noticed I follow Mike Poeta on Twitter. He's mentioned a few times about Carr just being a workhorse. Like he saw him running down the the street with a dummy once, or, or maybe it was weights to go to the stadium. But uh, my brother wrestled with his older brother up at Clarion. And my Joe, my my younger brother, couldn't say enough about him. Just the work ethic. Uh, it sounds like Mikey Carr is the same way. He's just a workhorse. You know, he's old school. Keeps his mouth shut. Does his job. Uh, so maybe he doesn't get the hype that a lot of guys do. And you know, Illinois is not as high profile as, as Iowa, Michigan, Ohio State, obviously Penn State. But uh, he's a guy that I'm cheering for, and, and you know, I think all PA fans should definitely appreciate. He's a throwback. Um, you know, big one for PA coming up. Red Lion High School. We have uh, Arizona State coming town to wrestle Lock Haven uh, at Red Lion. Uh, number one, Lock Haven's got a billboard up. Uh, these guys, these continue to amaze me with their marketing. But the big one there, you know, you got All American Josh Shields versus All American Chance Marsteller. That's a huge match. And, and I'll be honest, I think we're going to go opposite here. I'm a big fan of Shields. I think he gets the win here and kind of spoils the South Central PA homecoming for Chance. Um, I just think his pace is going to be a little bit too much. He's strong enough to hold Chance off. Uh, who do you see winning that one, Joe? Well, first and foremost, I, I, I need to make sure I give out a uh, shout out to Mike Catullo, uh, one of my uh, friends from West Virginia University wrestled there. He is the head coach at Redline and helped to put this whole thing together. So, again, uh, kudos to him to promote his program, uh, obviously promote wrestling, and to have, uh, you know, be able to host this uh, un- unbelievable event at, uh, you know, at the high school. Um, with that said, oh. 165 you you know hey in a sense shields is coming home too he's he's probably about two and a half three hours from home being out at red line high school uh, obviously he's marsteller's backyard to me very pro marsteller pro lock haven crowd um 
I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm just pumped to see this one because, uh, from, from several standpoints, uh, you know, I'm, for Marceller because one, he's a senior, he's chasing a national championship. He, you know, he's, he's put the, the ghosts of, you know, his earlier in his career, I think to sleep and is really making the most of this, this opportunity. He has a lock Haven and, you know, he gets to rest in front of his hometown fans one more time. Uh, he's a definite national title contender, uh, wrestling well this season. Then you have Josh Shields and it's a guy we've talked about on, on our podcast before, Rob, a guy that's just, he's in, he's in that second tier, but he's just, he's just banging on the door to get in that first tier guys. And, and I, I can't put him there yet. So he this would be a, this could be a, a real coming out party for him. This this is the type of match as we all know that you win and it 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 it, it could propel you or project you and and send your 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 season on a different trajectory. Um, honestly, I, I don't know how many clo- you know how many matches you can lose to top level guys match after match and still be considered a top level guy. Uh, I think this is uh, like you said. Uh, I'm not going to agree with you that I think he's going to win, but I think for him, this is one he's really got to look at. Like, uh, you know, this is one that he he really really needs to get after and and uh, and it had to have a good result for him personally uh, and, and for his season moving forward. However, however, there's always a however or a but. Uh, I just don't see how he does it. Um. Given this crowd, uh, I won't put it out of the realm of possibility, but I think there's going to be, you know, Marceller is going to come out just ready to go. You know, he's going to want to not, not, he's going to want to put on a show. He's going to want to win for the hometown fans. And, you know, the, I just think he's going to, at the end of the day, he's going to do what it takes to win. Again, I, I, I can't go wrong with either guy. I, you know, I'm a I'm big, big Marceller fan. I'm a big Shields fan. We're both PA guys. I've got to pick one. I got the guy. Got to go with the guy who's basically wrestling in his home, uh, you know, his hometown uh, for the dual meet. So that's that's my two cents. I I just I think that Marceller will you know ha, he'll be able to get to uh, you know get to the Shields legs score score takedown score two, and I, I think his shot defense will be the difference in keeping uh, keeping Shields from winning. Yeah, we'll see. It's a, that's going to be a good battle and you know, good good one for the fans down there. You know, sticking with uh, with Arizona State, you know they're traveling to Lehigh as well. Um, you know, ones to look out for there. One forty nine. You got Maruka and Skyler. Neither are ranked right now, but both former NCAA qualifiers. You're know, looking to climb back up there. Uh, Valencia and Cutler. I mean, I don't know if we need to talk about this a whole lot. It's, it's a top eight match, but Valencia had beaten him eleven to four prior. Uh, I don't see that being that competitive. As good as Cutler is. Um, Oklahoma, you got my man, Jake Woodley. He's taking on number six, Willie Miklas. You know, Woodley's been, been up and down this year, kind of some freshman growing pains, but this is a big match and, you know, I'll say it. I don't want to put too much pressure on him. I think he matches up well with what Miklas. I think Miklas rolls around a lot and I think Woodley might be a little bit too solid for him. At least I hope so. Um, you know, back to Lehigh, didn't mean to jump all over them, but they're also going to wrestle Virginia Tech. You know, Cutler, I mean, he's got a tough weekend. He's got... Dave McFadden as well. You know, that's the one he's going to have BC LaPrade, Josh Humphreys, and then, you know, big one heavyweight, Billy Miller and Jordan Wood. Um, you know, big one I want to talk about, though, Iowa Northwestern. I mean, do I have to tell you what I want to talk about, or, or can you catch my drift? Spencer Lee, Sebastian Rivera, enough said. All right? The match everyone's been talking about. First of all, Joe, do you think everyone shows up? Do you think both these guys wrestle, or do you think one of them is going to sit out? I hope so. Who are you picking, though? You know, until you brought that up, it, it, the thought didn't cross my mind. Um, I'm going to say they both show up. You know, I, I, I'm going to say it goes down again. So uh, it will be will be in Evanston, Illinois, Northwestern's home gym. We're going back to the original scene of of where it went down on on December 29th at Midlands. Uh, again, Rivera in his home gym. I'd have to imagine that Northwestern is going to do their best and and that to get the uh, to get fans out to make it as hostile as possible for for their uh, for the Wildcats. Uh, I don't know. It's hard. It's it's just hard to pick against Spencer Lee. This is like one of those moments for Spencer Lee where you know you think he's at a disposition and you think he's vulnerable and you know this would be like this could be one of those matches where he goes out and just makes a statement. He goes out and he just tears them apart. 
and just puts it all to rest, puts the, all the all the whispers uh, down the lane that, that he's that he's vulnerable, that he is not, you know, something's wrong, and uh, you know, so I'm gonna go with Spencer Lee. Uh, I'm gonna go with Spencer Lee. He's gonna come out and just make a statement, and he's gonna, and maybe that's the kiss of death for him because uh, I picked him. But uh, you know, I, I just feel like you know, like we talked about last week with with. Uh, Nolf and Berger and you know the chance that that Berger would be able to keep it close and stay in the match with them and I just felt that Nolf was going to go out and and show everyone why he's as dominant as he is and he did uh, I just think this is this is Spencer Lee's chance and he's on and when he's on the big stage uh, I feel like he just rises to the occasion and I think this is no different I think he goes out and and just puts it down puts the foot on the gas and and just gets after Rivera and and keeps Rivera on his toes. And I think that's where he, that's where the you know I don't know if there was something wrong last time, but that's where what that's where difference was. He in the match he never got to his offense and and, and put Rivera on, on defense on a defensive, and as a result, you know Rivera was able to impose his will a little bit, and it and it got Lee out of his game. I think it's roles reversed this time. I think Spencer Lee wins in a convincing fashion. Yeah, if I'm if I'm in the Lee camp. I want him coming out firing. I want him to put doubt in Rivera's head immediately because he got too comfortable last time. He got the first takedown, started getting confidence, got the second one, started getting confidence, and then it spiraled out of control, and Lee's, his feet were stuck in the mud. I mean, he looks sick or something. But, yeah, I'm going with Lee. I mean, has anyone beaten Lee twice in a row in his entire life? Like, that's a, that's an honest question. I don't know if anyone has. You know, I've watched this guy wrestle, shoot, since he's been eighth, ninth grade. I don't think anyone's gotten him twice in a row. So I don't foresee that happening again. I just really hope the match happens. You have 57. You got Deacon and Young rematch of the Midlands. Um, Deacon was a little bit too much for him there. But uh, Deacon, he, he gave the first takedown the other night as well. So he's maybe slipping a little bit. Young looks steady as, as ever. So that should be a good one. Uh, big ACC throwdown. You know, Mickey Phillippe is going to end up wrestling Corbin Myers. He's 2 and over him. But, you know, another tough match. Uh, Taylor Bermotti versus LaPrade, 14 versus 17. We'll see if Ramadi can get back on track. Uh, Bonacorsi versus Zavatsky. Uh, that was a 6-2 win by Zavatsky in Vegas. Uh, two WPIL guys. Uh, do you see the tables getting flipped on that one, or do you think Zavatsky is going to big brother him again? <laughs> big brother is a uh, uh, pretty, you know, just made me chuckle a little bit. But, yeah, I think he's going to – Zavatsky going to big brother him again, as you put it. Uh, you know, he's just – but it'll be interesting to see how Bonacorsi if he adjusts his the way he wrestles if he comes out being just as aggressive as he was, uh, or you know if they change it up and and you know uh, get him being a little more selective in his attacks because I think uh, you know he can uh, you know set a good pace but he's he can't he can't just uh, you know just just shoot uh, you know aimlessly uh, and and waste that opportunities in, in a match with a someone as talented as Zavasky. No, I agree with you. It's it's going to be tough. I'm not going to pick a winner. Um, I'm going to kind of ride the fence on this one, but uh, hopefully he doesn't shoot himself out. I'll say that much. And before we get to Beckman, um, you know, the big news out of PSU today is, is that Teasdale is no longer on the roster. Um, the reading between the lines, Kale said, you know, he's not going to be on our roster much longer. He, he's likely going to transfer. So it doesn't necessarily sound like it was Gavin's decision. I'm guessing some type of violation of team rules – um, call that what you will. That's me guessing, but that would be my guess to what happened. Here's the hope in the tease. They'll get somewhere and sorts it out. I, I get the feeling that he was maybe struggling with the weight among other things. So you know, he needs to get somewhere where he's not cutting as much weight. He's comfortable and just focus on wrestling and not, not all the bad stuff. Uh, Joe, do you have any closing thoughts on you know the Teasdale saga at Penn State? This Rob, this this just feels eerily similar as another wrestler we just talked about a little bit earlier, Chance Marsteller. You know, super talent, four time state champ, uh, maybe carrying a lot of pressure from in all directions to succeed, to be you know, maybe you know, the the bar is just set too high and, and you know, maybe just struggling with those expectations. I don't know, just speculation. I, I hear weight was an issue. Again, I, I, I said it before. I hear things, and that's it. Like it, it doesn't doesn't really go much further than that, I, unless I, I hear from the from you know directly credible source like Teasdale himself. Uh, I don't really get into the rumor rumor mill too much uh, because at the end of the day, he's an eighteen year old kid, and you know he's allowed to make mistakes, and you know he's been. Um, you know he he's struggling with something, and I just I just I just hope 
and you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be his biggest fan when he comes back to that. He makes things right. And, you know, gets, you know, right with school, gets right with wrestling and all those things. I hope it all comes together and, he, and he's able to overcome whatever it is that's going on in, in his uh, personal life outside of wrestling. Because, you know, the, the sport needs talent like him to be on the mat and, you know, uh, you know, doing, doing good things. Um, but, you know, if wrestling doesn't work out for him. I hope school does, and you know he finds uh, he finds peace with with whatever he chooses to do, as long as it's, uh, you know it's a uh, you know a good decision for him. But I don't want to get into like you said the speculations. It's not it's not fair to him. It's not fair to his family uh, or anyone that you're remotely close to being involved with it. You know I just I wish him well, and I hope he lands on his feet somewhere. Yeah. So the Chance Marsteller comparison, and that's I didn't even put that together, but absolutely. You know if Marsteller could turn it around with with his struggles. You know, Jared King is another guy that left Oklahoma. I, I do, do not know his story, but and I'm transferring to a smaller school and, and being a national champ. So it happens, right? Sometimes it's just a school. Kerry Colat, you know, didn't find the success he wanted at Penn State. Jamar Billman. Exactly. So this isn't the first time it happened. It's not the last. And it's not a death sentence for his career. Um, let's just hope wherever he ends up next is the right fit. Uh, Joe, what do you think about getting on the phone with, uh, with Mason here and, and seeing what he has to say? I'm looking forward to it. Dude's got a ton of energy, passionate about what he does, you know, and, and reading about him and, you know, another unique story, like a la Seth Ecker. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting him on the phone. So right now, Rob and I would like to welcome on George Mason University assistant coach Mason Beckman. Mason, thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule in the season here to come on and, and talk shop with us. Hey, anytime. Thank you guys for uh, for having me on. So, Mason, first question. Obviously, uh, you graduated Lehigh, and before getting into coaching, you uh, you tried out your hand in the real world, so to speak. Uh, talk to us about what you did down at uh, Kurt J. Lesker before getting into coaching. So, in my time at Lehigh, uh, I got my undergrad in supply chain management and my master's in engineering. Um, so, when I graduated, like you said, I started working for the Kurt J. Lesker company um, as a process engineer. So, you know, I did a little bit of everything, um, a little bit on the procurement side, a little bit on the process layout side. Um, it was a great experience, and I worked with some really special people there, you know, some people that I still stay in contact with and everything. And it was a great experience for those couple of years working in the real world and, you know, again, so to speak, um, and, and gaining that experience on what the business world is like, what – real life professionalism outside of wrestling looks like, you know, I gained a lot of skills and a lot of experience from that in those two short years um, that are definitely very valuable. And outside of that, obviously I rode shotgun, so to speak with Jim Akerley down at the quest school of wrestling, the same club I grew up wrestling in. So I never left wrestling. Um, I doubt that I ever will, especially now that it's what I do for a living. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, like I said, I did a little bit of everything down at the Kurt J. Lester Company and spent my free time coaching with uh, Jim Akerley. So, Jim Akerley, West Virginia, got to give him a shout-out as, as an alumni. And uh, that Quest School is, you know, just churns out talent year after year. So, like you said, you never left wrestling. So my question was going to be, like, what got you into coaching? But since you kind of never left it and you, you transitioned right away, you know, did you always know when you took the job in the real world as that supply, you know, as, uh, you know, in the various titles you held that you were going to stay with coaching? Was that always part of your, your plan? Absolutely. I never knew what capacity in which I would coach long term, whether it would be taking over – the Quest School of Wrestling for Coach Akerley or ending up in the college world or ending up at a high school somewhere, you know, you're never really sure where life takes you, right? And you just, the way that I look at it, you kind of roll with the punches. But staying in wrestling is something that's always been very important to me. This sport has given me so much. The community within the wrestling world is a really special one and a very tightly knit one, especially in Pennsylvania, um, especially in Western Pennsylvania, right? So, it's something that I always knew that I would stay in. Again, I was never a thousand percent sure exactly the, the capacity in which that would be, but I definitely always wanted to coach. Um, you know, in high school, 
I started doing private lessons with young kids in the Reynolds program, um, just on the mat in my basement. And from the first time I started doing that, I, I really took to coaching. It's something that I've always really enjoyed. So basically from the beginning, the first time I started coaching and mentoring kids from, um, you know, when I was still a teenager, when I was still 16, 17 years old, um, it's something that I've always loved to do. So I knew that it was something I always really wanted to do. And I've been really fortunate to work alongside of Jim Akerley, who obviously I'm very biased growing up in his club and having coached alongside of him. But who I think is every bit as good of a club coach as anywhere you'll find in the United States. Um, and I think results would speak for themselves there. And then obviously the opportunity I've had down here. So I've gotten to coach with some pretty special people. So I've had really positive experiences, which has helped. So Mason, on that note, Coach Akerley, uh, Santoro, you know, two guys that are really established and, and really, you know, renowned. And then Beasley, he's he's pretty young in his coaching career, but I think everyone knows this guy is really good. What have you learned from those three that, that I don't know, maybe makes them different, but things you've picked up on? Are you allowed to give us any of the secrets, I guess is what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, man. Truth be told, there aren't a whole lot of secrets. Um, I've learned a lot from all three. And they're all three different. But there, there is one main common thread, or I, I should say two common threads between those three men. Um, the first common thread is that they, they put life over wrestling and that they care about the development of the student athletes, the young adults that are in their respective programs, whether it be the Lehigh University program, the Quest School of Wrestling, or here at George Mason. Um, first and foremost, all three of them understand and fully endorse that wrestling is a tool to develop better young adults to develop for, for young adults to create a great life experience and teach themselves things and you know if you, you're fortunate enough to wrestle at the division one level to get yourself a great education right so that's thing number one um, and that's something that I learned from a young age through my parents and, and through the Reynolds program as well as from all three of them um, the other common thread between the three is that it just at the end of the day it all comes down to hard work um, coaching in that aspect isn't a whole lot different than than being a competitive athlete or than doing anything else in life. You just have to be willing to outwork everybody else, um, whether it's recruiting, whether it's putting time into the you know in the room with your with your student athletes, developing relationships through administration, through fundraising, whatever it is. Um, those are the two common threads between the three of them. Um, they definitely all have their nuances. They're all three technically brilliant as far as teaching wrestling goes and adapting to the different styles of the different student athletes. Um, but the two main things that I've learned from those three and the massive amount of success that they've all had is that coaching is about relationships. Um, you have to understand your student athletes, the people that, you know, because especially at the college, I mean, at any level, when, you know, a quest, I got to coach kids from the time they, the first time they ever put on a pair of wrestling shoes, right? And when parents bring you their kids at that age, that's a lot of trust, right? And it's on you as a coach to develop a relationship with that kid, whether they be six years old, 16 years old, or 21, 22, 23 years old, uh, you know, as you come through a Division One program. And the same thing in college. When you make that decision as to where you're going to wrestle in college, that's a huge life decision, probably the biggest life decision that the that, – that a 17, 18 year old young adult has made in that in their life, right? Especially one that they're mainly in charge of. So the the main thing I've learned from those three is it's a, coaching's about relationships, and you always need to put the 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 young adult, the kid before the athlete. Um, and again, number two is it's not magic. There's no there's no secret to success. It's just hard freaking work. You got to be willing to outwork everybody. So you kind of touched on this, Mason, with the relationships and, and things like that in your last answer, but the transition for you from the business world and I don't, I don't want to say the real world because you know, you're in the real world. You're just, your profession is just what you're doing now is completely different than what you went to school for in a sense. So when transitioning from that job as a professional outside the realm of wrestling – to what you're doing now, did you face any challenges in that in that uh, in this first year, or have you? Fa- I should say, have you faced any challenges? Absolutely. Um, 
face challenges every day. You know, there were certain things that I was never exposed to, just not for lack of trying, just you're not exposed to them until you are a college wrestling coach. Certain things like fundraising or understanding how financial aid works and, and you know, helping recruits go through the application process and different things like that. So there have absolutely been growing pains. Um, Coach Beasley has been has been awesome. I couldn't have asked for a better boss or mentor or friend, honestly, than Frank to to help me with all of the things that, quite frankly, I was clueless about. Um, there have definitely been some growing pains. I, I've tripped up more than once, but yeah, I mean, there have been there have definitely been unique challenges, some things that I didn't expect. But one thing that the business world taught me that has really helped with all of that is and I mean you guys both understand this in in an office job in you know the quote unquote business world one of the things it teaches you is to show up you know at eight o'clock and you work till five and you show up at eight and you put your nose to the grindstone and you get after it for eight nine hours a day and you show up every day and that's what you do um so both through wrestling and through you know having that structured approach for those couple years in the business world um, of learning to do things, being exposed to things I've never been exposed to. That has really helped with the transition. Um, and again, having a great boss and mentor in Coach Beasley, as well as the rest of our staff. I mean, Cam Eppert uh, is our head assistant. He coached at Wisconsin and Wabash before that. Um, Cam's been a huge help because he's been through a lot of this stuff before at different schools. So he's been a, he's been a really big help too. Um, you know, so between Frank and Cam, as people that have been through it before. And I, I mean, I still call Cam, Coach Santoro, Coach Hughes, Coach Dillon all the time um, and ask for their input, and they're still mentors of mine. So there have definitely been growing pains, but, again, I'm surrounded by great people, so it's been a big help. So how did, how did you come to, to meet Coach Beasley, and when the job was open, did he approach you or did you approach him about it? It's kind of a funny story. So I think Frank and I – we always kind of knew of each other, just the wrestling world's a small one. Um, you know, I got to be pretty good friends with multiple members of the North Carolina State staff while he was there. And, but, you know, Frank and I never really developed a, a very deep relationship. Um, we had a lot of mutual friends. And at NHSCA's, the freshman, sophomore, junior, senior nationals, in the spring, I was standing there talking to a mutual friend of ours, another college coach, and it just so happened we're standing by the doors and Frank walks in, you know, so right when he walks in, he walks over to us and we all get to talking and, you know, I ask him how things were going down here in Fairfax. And I wasn't even fishing to see, you know, if jobs were open or anything like that. And, and when he mentioned that he was hiring a new staff, um, I was like, Oh, okay, great. Um, you know, that's, it's awesome. I'm sure that's a big step for you. Any idea, you know, do you have anybody in mind or anything like that? And, again, I wasn't even fishing. Truth be told, I never thought he'd consider me. Um, you know, I, I've got a really high opinion of Frank, and obviously his body work speaks for itself. So, again, I never thought he'd consider me. And I kind of made a joke after he mentioned that he had some people in mind for who he wanted to call and bring in the interview. I was like, hey, what the heck, man? My name's plastered all over campus. You didn't even shoot me a text. I thought we were friends. So... We kind of laughed about it, and I walked away, didn't think anything of it. So between that and two weeks later at Flow Nationals, apparently he called around and talked to a few people asking if they knew whether or not I was willing to make the jump into college coaching and if they thought I would be interested. So again, at Flow Nationals, I'm there coaching the Quest guys. I walk up, and I'm – saying hi to some friends of mine that coach in the college level. I see Frank again, and, you know, I kind of bust his chops again. Same thing. Like, still haven't got that text, Frank, man. I, it's kind of brutal. Um, and it was at that point that I think he realized that I was kind of serious about, um, you know, being willing to, to make the jump. So he called me on my drive home from Flow Nationals. He actually tried to catch me before I left, but our guys had been done wrestling uh, before he called me. So he called me, said, hey, let's talk tomorrow, called me the next day, and um, that was that. Mason, so that on, on that note, you know, you're in year one. What's the best thing about being a college coach, I mean, doing it as a profession as opposed to, 
you know, helping out with the club, doing it part time? I think the best thing is that I wake up every day and I get to go to work. You know, there's no, there's nothing that I have to do that I have to drag myself to do. I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. You know, some of the paperwork, some of the administrative stuff, it's nobody's favorite thing. But every day I get to go to work. I get to show up and help build a program, do something here that's never been done before with three other guys and Frank, Cam, and, and Bo Donahue, our volunteer assistant. But those three guys that, you know, we've all become friends. We all work together towards the same goal, um, and everybody's working as hard as they can. And with a team full of guys, full of young adults, you know, with our, with our student athletes that, you know, they're chasing dreams. And that's really the cool part is you, you get to be part of a support system, part of, um, you know, one of the mentors for young adults that really are just trying to help improve their life situations. We've got multiple uh, young adults on our team that are first generation college students. Um, you know, Tion Anthony, one of our senior captains, one of our fifth year captains that was a national qualifier last year. Tion's a kid that he's an inner city Baltimore kid and he's used wrestling to, to drastically change his life circumstances for the better. Um, and that's honestly the best part about it is that you get to help these guys find a way into a better life and push themselves and just grow into great young adults who are, whether they ever set foot in wrestling again or not, after they leave here, um, make a positive impact in the world. Mason. So you gave us the good stuff there. And I don't want you to complain to our millions and millions of fans or come off like a whiner, but what maybe is the hardest part or, or what surprised you about, you know, maybe it's more than just the X's and O's about being a, a full-time college coach. Um, it's a good question. I would probably say the amount of time that is spent doing completely non wrestling related things, whether it be, you know, meeting and talking with alumni, um, doing administrative work, doing things for compliance, um, all athletics meetings, you know, the amount of time that everybody on our staff spends doing quote unquote non wrestling related things. Um, that's the majority of the job. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's just the reality of it. You know, I think a lot of people, and I know I was guilty of this for a long time. When you think of a college wrestling coach, you think of somebody that goes and hangs out in the wrestling room all day, right? That spends all day in a t-shirt and shorts and, and in their wrestling shoes. But the reality of it is it's a very white collar job for the majority of your day. Um, and I think that, even though I knew that that was the, the case to a certain degree, I didn't realize that it was to such a, such a great extent. Um, which, again, isn't a bad thing. That's partially – that's a big part of why I'm, I'm glad that I got the experience in the business world. But I definitely didn't realize how much, again, non-wrestling-related work there was um, to the job. So Mason, as as we look at what you guys are building down there in Virginia, you guys are doing a pretty good job of getting some PA guys and getting some PA talent down there. You know what is um what's the hard like what what do you find is the hardest part of getting a, a you know getting inroads with the PA kids? You know Mason, not, you know George Mason, not exactly uh, a household name. Uh, that's changing, and the perception is definitely changing. Like, do you guys have like? Uh, do you guys know if you can get a guy on campus? You can get him to 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 give you a serious look. Like, what is your your guys' outlook with each recruit that you do get to come set foot on campus? So, I I would say the biggest challenge. I mean, one one of the things is certainly um, perception, right? You always fight perception, especially in this day and age. Um, where teenagers, and I think we're all guilty of this in the social media world, where image and perception are a big part of it, right? So you get an image wrapped in your head, and it takes a long time to change that. Oftentimes it takes longer for perception to catch up to reality, right? You'll have a program that's actually winning like crazy in any sport, and perception hasn't quite caught up to it, right? So that, that's, that's thing number one is perception. Um, and like you said, it's definitely changing, and that's one of the things that we try to get out there every day. Um, so, so that's one of the things. Um, 
Another one is just that, I mean, hey, everybody's going after Pennsylvania kids. You know, it's the best best wrestling state in the country. We have the most, most more Pennsylvania natives are Division One All-Americans every year than any other state for a reason. So everybody's recruiting Pennsylvania. So it's just hard to get good Pennsylvania guys because everybody wants them. They've got a lot of exposure. There's a lot of attention given to them, and rightfully so. So, you know, that's a challenge in and of itself. Like you said, I definitely feel that, and I shouldn't say I feel that. I know that we have something special. We have something very unique going on down here, and every recruit that has come down and experienced, whether on an unofficial or an official visit, experienced what we have going on down here, whether or not they've decided to come here, Every single one of them has said, "You got, you know, hey, you guys, you're doing something different." Um, so we feel pretty good if we can get a recruit on campus. It can really show them what the the be on common hashtag and, and lifestyle is all about. Um, so you know, like you said, we feel pretty good about it if we can get a recruit on campus. No program is right for everybody. We will never claim that it is, but if we can get a recruit on campus, we feel very good about how we can portray our program. You know, we provide a lot of transparency. There's no smoke and mirrors to what we do. So we feel pretty good about it if we can get somebody down here and give them the experience. So talking about staying with Pennsylvania, what do you miss about not being in Pennsylvania? Well, first and foremost, obviously, you know, I miss being close to my family, right? I miss being able to drive 20, 30, 40 minutes and see my sister, my brother-in-law, or my dad, my stepmom, or drive, spend an hour and a half to drive up to Reynolds. So that's number one. Um, I miss coaching with Jim Akerley, and I miss the Quest School of Wrestling, those kids and their families quite a bit. You know, obviously I stayed in touch with all of them, and, you know, a lot of them grew to be family. Um, you know, I miss that. And don't get me wrong, I, I love what I'm doing. I'm, it's coming down here, it's the best decision I ever made, but I, I do miss being part of that family. Um, the wrestling culture in Pennsylvania is just a different creature. And this is actually my first time living outside of Pennsylvania. You know, I grew up in Reynolds. I wrestled at Lehigh, and then I lived down in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. So I've always been in wrestling hotbeds and not, you know, not ones that are relative wrestling hotbeds. You know, Reynolds High School is probably, when you look at what they're dealing with with resources and student body, probably the most successful program. I'll put it against any program in the United States. Um, They've got 850 wins and less than 100 losses in in the school's history. They've never had a losing season. So, you know, that's where I grew up. Um, Lehigh speaks for itself. And then obviously you guys know the Whippeal and and Quest. So moving outside of Pennsylvania has definitely given me perspective on what an amazing wrestling culture it is. Um, Now, Virginia, Northern Virginia has, has shocked me, to be honest, because this is wrestling country far more than I expected. I'm going to high school matches here and, and our home duels. People love wrestling down here as well, but I do miss, you know, walking into, I really miss sheets too. There aren't as many sheets down here. Um, I miss that quite a bit. I love sheets. Uh, um, and for Manny brothers, I miss that a lot, but you know, I miss being able to walk into, you know, anywhere, a giant Eagle with a wrestling t-shirt on and you'd get, it was like he got stopped by every other person because they wrestled in high school or they wrestled in college. And that's really unique to Pennsylvania. You don't really find that anywhere else to that extent. So you talked about wrestling hotbeds and being from out West and wrestling for Reynolds and living in, in the heart of the Whippy Ole and going to Lehigh and Lehigh Valley. So we had Sammy Sasso on a few weeks back and, you know, we asked him a similar question, you know, which, which area is better and why? So we talk about with the two, uh, I mean, the Lehigh Valley and the Whippeal. You know, give me your opinion and give us your opinion. Uh, which is better and why? Oh, man, that's a hard one. Um, and I experienced them on two very – in two different roles. So it's it's a little bit hard to compare. And I don't mean to say that to duck, to duck the question. But Lehigh – the Lehigh Valley is incredible because as a Lehigh wrestler – you know, the Lehigh Valley was named by USA Wrestling, I think when I was in high school, as the number one wrestling hotspot in the country. And the Whippeal was like number two or three. But the Valley is incredible because you have all these storied high school programs, you know, from the Easton, the Nazareth, the Northampton, the Bethlehem Catholic, um, Bethlehem Liberty, Parkland, the list goes on and on and on, right? 
you have all these great programs that compete compete against each other. But Lehigh University is the only Division One program in that area. So they all congregate to Grace Hall, to Lehigh, um, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sundays, four Lehigh matches, right? So you get all these different these different wrestling programs that are these huge programs to come together to support Lehigh. So that's that's a really cool and a really special thing, and it made wrestling there a, a ton of fun. It was a great experience. The Whippeal, I mean, again, the same kind of thing. You have so many great story programs in the area and obviously, you know, nationally elite kids. And the Whippeal is different because, and the Valley's a big area in terms of population, but, you know, Pittsburgh's a major city and you have a, you have so many people and it's pretty wild to be walking through downtown Pittsburgh and, you know, you walk into a restaurant or whatever, and, so, and you see somebody sitting up at the bar or sitting in a booth wearing their high school wrestling T-shirt, right? Um, and Yinzers love talking wrestling. So, you know, if I had to pick. You got to pick one, Mason. All right. So I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, do the political thing here. I'm going to split it. I'm going to say the Whippeal's the better high school wrestling area and the Lehigh Valley's the better college wrestling spot. You really hedged your bets and, and kept both sides uh, in your good graces or – you know, stayed in, the, in their good graces with that answer there. Governor Beckman. And I, hey, I got to recruit both areas, man. This, this is true. Yes, you're, you're, looking at, <laughs> you're looking at it through a different lens than we are. Very true. But, I mean, again, they're both awesome areas, and it is hard to pick. Um, I think it would be a little bit different if I had experienced both as an athlete, but I saw them through two totally different lenses, which is why it's kind of hard for me to compare. Mason, talking about career progression – you know, you're a guy with a master's in engineering, obviously very career-oriented. Do you want to be a head coach one day? Is that even on your radar right now? Yeah, it's definitely an end goal. I would love to, to be the head coach of a program and, and to have a, a – I don't want to say a program of my own, but you know, I think you guys understand what I mean. But that is, that's a long way away. And right now and for the foreseeable future, you know, five, six, seven years – I'm going to be part of George Mason wrestling for a long time. You know, I'm part of my decision-making process when I made the jump into college wrestling and which, which program I wanted to be part of was going somewhere that I could stay for quite a while, that, that I could be part of building something that we could build something of our own. And obviously I feel and I know that we have the opportunity to do something really, really special here. And we're going to, you know, it's already happening. Um, I think you guys mentioned earlier that you can see how much it's changing, already has changed and it's continuing to change. So I have no plans. I will not be leaving here for quite some time. You know, if and when that happens somewhere down the road, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But that's not going to happen for quite a while. I can promise you guys that. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's always been a dream of mine to be a college head coach. So for sure, that's still an end goal of mine. But again, you know how life works. Um, plans never really pan out how you, you have them in your head. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. We'll see what opportunities come up, but right now, and for quite a while here, the only thing I'm focused on is learning as much as I can, growing as much as I can and growing the George Mason wrestling program into a national power. Mason, last question. You know, when you're recruiting, uh, you know, a high school Mason Beckman out there, a super stud, going to be a program changer, what's the pitch? What, what makes you guys uncommon? Why should uh, a blue chip want to go wrestle at George Mason? There's a lot of reasons. So I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. First and foremost is the education. You know, uh, George Mason University, we're a tier one research university. Um, the fastest university to ever reach that status. You know, it's the highest tier of academics and research. Washington, D.C. is right next door. So the the D.C. and Northern Virginia job market, which, hey, at the end of the day, you go to college to get a degree, you get a great degree to set yourself up for, for a better life, for a great life long term, right, for a great career. And the D.C. job market, the Northern Virginia job market, or if you want to expand the scope a little bit, the Pittsburgh and Philadelphia job markets, both of which are well within four hours, um, you've got some incredible job markets there to, to provide some pretty special opportun opportunities for you when you finish up your, your undergrad and your master's here. 
Um, we have the highest job placement rate and starting salary of any university in the state of Virginia and one of the highest in the country. So, you know, A number one, whatever you want to do in life, you're set up really well to do it here through a great education, uh, a great support system within the university and the program. Um, from a purely wrestling oriented view, there's a special opportunity here. It's not often that in any aspect of life, you get to do a forever thing that you get to leave your mark somewhere forever and do something that's never been done. And everybody has the opportunity to do that here. Our program has had three guys, all American, a total of four times. Um, like you guys said earlier, it's not a program. When you think of, it's not necessarily a historical household name in any stretch by any stretch of the imagination. Right? So, the, the, the young men that are, that are coming here, the Ryan Vulocks, the Josh Jones, the Colby Hoes um, that have committed to or are already here, they want to be part of changing things. They want to do what that first wave of guys that wrestled for Coach Beasley at North Carolina State did. You know, they were the first group to ever bring home a team trophy for NC State, and that's the same thing here. We're going to win the first ever team trophy here. Somebody will be our first national champ. Somebody will be our first four-time All-American. And, again, they, they have the opportunity to do something here that's never been done. Um, and Coach Beasley has produced guys that have won world medals, national titles. You know, So his coaching resume speaks for itself. Um, Cam, again, at Wisconsin, helped Coach Evan Wick to a third-place finish to the national tournament. Um, you know, between my competitive career and quest, I've been pretty fortunate with the things that I've been able to do. And uh, Bo was part of that class in North Carolina State that went from 63rd his true freshman year to fourth in the country last year as seniors. So we've all been pretty fortunate to be successful in our own right, and, and we've all been part of changing programs. So that's what recruits have the opportunity to do here, and that's what we're doing here. Um, they get to be that group, that class, that 5, 10, 15 years from now, when we're consistently in the top 10, that everybody's kind of looking around at each other going, man, how on earth did this happen? How did this program rise so fast and, and, and stay there? They'll go back and point to this group, the group that, that's in the program and coming into the program right now in these next couple of years as the group that changed it. And that's a pretty special thing. So, again, everybody wants something a little bit different in their experience, but the young men that – they come here to George Mason. They have an opportunity to get a great life-changing education, uh, set themselves up for a great job. And while they're at it, do something here that's never been done athletically, be part of changing a program and winning at the highest level. We finished with such just honest words, uh, you know, spoken with, with passion uh, about the program. And I think that's what you get. And thing, it, it just comes out in everything you say about George Mason, about the job you guys are doing down there. So again, uh, I, you know, we know right in the heart of the season at this point, and you took some time out of the night to, to uh, away from all that paperwork, all that administrative stuff that that you talked about to uh, to like I said, come on talk with us. So I, I know uh, I speak for both of us. We really do appreciate you uh, carving out some time. Yeah, absolutely, man. I I really appreciate you guys having me on. I'm always more than happy to to take the time to talk to you guys. I love talking wrestling. I'm sure anybody that's ever run into me knows I can talk for days on end. So. I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to, to come on and, and shed some light on everything that we have going on down at George Mason. Um, you know, as far as you guys go, you guys are doing an awesome job with this show. I really appreciate you guys taking over where Tristan and I left off. Um, you guys have made it bigger and better than it was, so keep crushing it. Um, to all you guys at PA Power, you know, Jeff, Eric, you guys, everybody that contributes, Coach Billet, Mr. Upson, keep doing great things for Pennsylvania for the sport. Um, <laughs> And hopefully we'll be able to talk to you guys again soon. Likewise, wishing you nothing but the best. So that'll wrap it up for another week here in the open room with Rob and Joe. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, visit PAPowerWrestling.com for all your wrestling needs. Follow us on Twitter at PA Power Wrestle. Give us a thumbs up on Facebook and check us out on Instagram. Don't forget, fans, you can subscribe to PA Power Podcast on iTunes and listen to all three shows on Spotify. If you want to send any questions or suggestions for the show, email us at college talk at pa powerwrestling.com. Thanks and have a good one, folks. We'll talk to you next week.